That's it. Well, did Martin disappear down the river? Or did they pull it? Please say Martin didn't disappear well, down the three, river. Three of them were, they were going. Didn't, did you ever see him come back? They got all my stuff on that boat. I wouldn't care if they didn't have all my stuff. Well, Bob Webb and, and my, Ted are with him, so. Uh, oh, somehow well. I'm not reassured. <laughs> 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 I can't <laughs> believe it. They just pulled right in around the corner, but they yeah. were smoking cigars, and Ann didn't want them smoking upwind of the kitchen, so they went off and... Isn't that they, funny? They were going by. <laughs> so are we rolling? Oh, listen to that raven. Yeah, let's let's have the raven quoting in the background. Never more, never more. Yes. <laughs> okay. Where so do we this is so is this a new tape? Yeah. It was a new tape this morning. Well, we're coming back to part three of the oral River Runners Oral History Project. It's still September fifteenth, nineteen ninety four. And we hadn't even gotten to the Grand Canyon yet, huh? I know, but oddly enough, I really, the, as I s probably said before, the Upper Canyon is the more, um, I remember it better in terms of dramatics and so forth. So what do we start with? Well, just how that, how, where we, seemed like where we ended up was uh, that, um, with that second, with the boat flipping and stuff. Oh. And then you guys had kind of broken into a couple of groups, and you hadn't gotten to Lee's Ferry or anything, but no. you had, the four of you guys had just kind of broken off from oh, Neville's okay, and okay. El Zeta. All right. Um, we did call ourselves the Gripers, as a matter of fact, the four of us. And we even, Don was the one who noticed that the birds in the bushes were saying, gripe, 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 because... We were complaining about this and that. <laughs> I don't know what birds those were. but And um, it was, you know, this was a very pleasant, just to, we didn't work very hard rowing. We just flowed with the, with the current and, um, and enjoyed ourselves. And it was in that section, I think, was it um, Diane or you that I was telling that that was the section in which uh, a plane flew over and dropped notes to us Sarah, with on little parachute things and which well, they wanted us to identify ourselves and ask us if we needed help and there were these prescribed gymnastics we were to go through which I don't really quite remember uh, except that one of them was that if we were if we needed help, we were to do one one thing, and one of those things was lying down, all of us in a row, and then we would do other things if if somebody if we needed food, and so we we got through that. It was really ridiculous. This plane circling above us, and we were simply uh, going through these maneuvers. I thought it was probably a good thing that somebody was checking up on us at that time. But, and we were not that far from, from Lee's Ferry because my, my family didn't, didn't know that we had been found, as it were. And um, I think the department head, who had a lot of connections with Washington because he'd done a lot of plant introduction stuff, and I think he had raised a sufficient outcry at his missing botanists so that uh, somebody went into action because it was a Coast Guard plane that that flew up and that kind of surprised me. Uh, so there was a lot of publicity? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, a, a lot. Um, but we did then pull into to Lee's Ferry and I think that great picture that you redid was probably one of the things that we had to go through because no one was there when we got to, or the essential cafe newsman wasn't there when we first landed. So we had to do a landing all over again. And then somebody suggested the other, 
various poses that were taken. Well, how, how long had you been there before the news guys showed up? Uh, not long, probably no more than a half an hour. And, and there was a welcoming committee. Somebody came in with watermelon and some other goodies that I don't, I just remembered the watermelon and because uh, that was so refreshing. And, and then, so I heard the story, so you guys laid over there for a while. Yeah, quite, uh, we, we had to because Norm needed to get two more boatmen and we were not really certain that the trip would continue at that, um, at that point. It really depended on whether he could just all out of the blue pick up two more people to, to replace Don and, and Jean. Well, what, how, what did you think about that? Did you, were you wanting to go or? Oh, I wanted to go if the trip continued. I was, uh, I don't think I would have, um, I wouldn't have been mad at anybody if we hadn't because it, it looked very chancy when, when we were, were there. And, um, but we obviously didn't feel sure that the trip was going to continue because Bill and I were supposed to have gone down and, and repainted the boats in the time that we were there. And I think two things, as, as you probably have discovered, I don't like to expend a great deal of effort if I'm not sure that it's going to be worth anything. And it was what, it's, it's seven miles, isn't it? From six miles from Marble Canyon Lodge where we were staying down to the landing at Lee's Ferry. It's a distance anyway. I'm not sure how far Is it? What, what from the highway. It's pretty, yeah, it's a good three. Uh, three miles, you think? Or four. It, Anyhow. Seven. Seven. So, well, yeah. This, this we, we knew it. Was, they had brought us up from there in, in cars. And um, so we debated some. And then some of our time went when Buzz came up to, Buzz Holmes, Holmstrom came up to talk to us and the first thing we knew it was midday and I think we decided it just wasn't worth walking all that way down to paint boats that we didn't know whether it was going to be any use to us or not. So Buzz Holmstrom came up and met you guys at Lee's Ferry. Uh, yeah, uh, we, no, he never, he never got down to the ferry. He only, we, we talked on the bridge and in the, the motel uh, lodge. And that's where those pictures are taken with us standing on Navajo Bridge. He trailered his boat up. I never saw those pictures. Yes, he brought his somebody, boat. Somebody has, somebody has one in a book that's here someplace. Yeah, I'll kill him. Otherwise, I'll be hmm. waving. Where'd he go, time. that little rascal? Fly. Yeah. yeah. Don't There's don't hit him on me. <laughs> and I feel very very self conscious because it's me who's flying yeah. flying he around. A shot up right I got sort of clean hands because he's taking pictures. Two to explain that. There he goes. Two flies. Let's see if you're as quick as a fly. Oh. <laughs> that was on the chair. There's Jeez. a bunch of them around here. I don't know you're what wonderful. drew them. Must be me. I don't see him. Oh, there he is. Anyway, scared. so he came up there and he brought his boat. He brought his boat because, and he, this is the neat thing about Buzz. He said to us, uh, I came up with this boat because I had some idea of putting in and going uh, hunting for you. And he said, of course, I thought it would be good publicity too. And, and <laughs> You know, not many men would, excuse me, I just sound like a feminist, not many people would. <laughs> hey, that's okay, Brad, you ought to hang out. I'll bring another roll. Uh, would admit um, the first time they met some pe people, he was very ingenuous and very, very modest, really. And I think, I think a little embarrassed when he, when he, met us too because he was the one that had said the river is no place for a woman and um, when he 
when he came up. I don't think he met Elsie until Boulder Dam, but we we talked a long time. I don't remember whether it was the whole afternoon or what. What did you think of him? I thought he was great. I really thought he was, you know, people people talk about Don Harris, and I, I think Don was great too, but I really, if one could, ha could be a hero worshiper at 24, um, Buzz was the, the one that appealed to me greatly. And he, uh, the, one of the things in the picture that doesn't show up is that he's handing me his match case that he carried on his original trip. It has a compass at one end, and it's about so long, and a black tube. And he even, it even had matches in it. And we tried them out later, and they lit fine. And he was giving it to me to take down the rest of the canyon. And as a matter of fact, I still, I still have that. And that's the, the thing that one of the, I forget now who um, had, had said that. that Richard would, suggested Oregon mm, historical. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I wouldn't have. I still have that thing, and I wouldn't have kept it unless I really thought it was neat. Sure. Battery, so we should, we should, and he, he put in all by himself, and he came all the way down through here. And I don't know, did he go clear to the ocean? No. But he went, he, he I, oh, I, I say no. Oh, because there was Hoover Dam, because Boulder Dam, was the dam? Yeah, the dam was absolutely. But he touched on, because. Are we rolling? I seem to remember him saying that he touched onto the to the dam. Well, he, you know, that to me was really something to go through here. I don't know what maps he had. I don't remember that he he may have mentioned that. But to start out all by yourself and to have the degree of we said, I didn't know whether I'd get through or not, but I just thought I'd, I'd try. But he had done a, a lot of, um, in Oregon, I know he had done a lot of boating. And I think he had probably run the Snake and some other rivers um, before he got involved in, in this. And someone um, in the Maxon party, which was, what, 1920? No. Uh, someone in in the USGS party that um, Maxon was with out of there were a couple of Caltech people on it, and they ran into him someplace. And somebody said to him, "I think he caught up w with them in in a later trip." And they said, "Well, Buzz, were were, were you ever scared?" on the trip and he said oh gee I was scared all the time uh, you know he, he never he never bragged on anything and um, and I don't think he was really he was pretty he might have really meant more accurately that he was not fully comfortable all the time but I can't imagine him being really frightened but, uh, well it sounded like really something so he's he stood out from the crowd. Oh right? yes, oh yes, cool. and a lot of people. The the somebody made the comment when we were up at Grand Canyon Village that Buzz was really he was drinking a lot and going to seed. And I I wrote in my diary, and this sounds so dumb as if I really knew. I said he didn't have the look of a habitual drinker. Well, he didn't. You know, <laughs> I know. I well, what I I pictured was somebody with a red nose and and sort of vague and you know that's my idea of a habitual heavy drinker. I I don't know. Somehow he was a guy that he must have been, and he wrote to you several times. Oh yeah, I don't. I had letters, at least seven or eight letters from him, um, and. Some of them were written that summer when it, when he went down, he did go down later that, in 1938. He made a trip down um, and he posted a letter, I think when they started 
um, again, this was starting high up at, in Green River, Wyoming, and Green River, Utah. And I know you, uh, there was a letter from the, the canyon, um, that is from Bright Angel, from Phantom Ranch, because he had some some complaint about the people had uh, he, f he felt were charging him too much for supplies and then he said I have to take that back because they gave us a lot of stuff and <laughs> which was typical I think too of, of Buzz he wanted the record to be straight and then one year and I'm vague now on which year it might have been the, at the end of the following that is at the end of maybe 1940 he took a, a woman who wanted to go across the country on rivers only. And if you can imagine, I don't, I don't remember the route, but it involves some portaging in, in between in order to get over the Continental Divide and so forth. And they ended by going down the Missouri to the Ohio and then up the Ohio and ended in New York. So. Um, and, and Buzz didn't think much of the eastern rivers because most of them then received a lot of garbage and sewage and other stuff. So there were probably two or three letters. And then I think maybe another one after he got back to Coquille, uh, Oregon. And then I didn't hear from him, and I don't know now just what in what year he died. But, yeah. uh, you, it seemed like he was a guy that didn't, he was going to, he didn't quite fit in in the normal. I, I'm sure that, well, you know, that wasn't the usual sort of thing that anybody did. Hard thing to follow up. Well, were you scared and what did he tell you about coming down here? Um, there were plenty of times that I was scared, um, in the sense that if you leap into a boat and go through your first rapids that's scary and and besides we didn't know where we were going we didn't know exactly what we were doing and we had lost a boat and yeah I was I was scared but it was quite exhilarating and I remember only once uh, thinking that it was pretty dumb to have come down there and that was when we were trying to do the bit of portaging the boats in in the, cataract and then I thought well you know this is you, you got yourself into you know nobody made me come <laughs> so but they're at least very looking at you know getting ready to run the Grand Canyon with these boatmen who had gone and and did Buzz did you did he encourage you or did he tell you he didn't think you ought to go or how did or did you or did the subject even come up he was very sympathetic listening to and, and we did. We unloaded many, many complaints. But I don't uh, recall that he said, don't do it. And at the end of the trip, when he met us um, with many other people at, at Boulder, he said, um, he, he wrote, on my sun helmet to the girl who proved me badly wrong, referring to the fact that the canyon was no place for a woman. I don't know what he'd think now about me stumbling over the rocks and falling down in Deer Creek and, and um, whatnot, but um, but I, I wasn't, well, maybe it's a question of not bright enough, being bright enough to be really afraid. I, we, I certainly wasn't terrorized. Um, any time on the on the trip. After I saw those boats go through the rapids, all or the one go through the rapids all by itself, I may have even thought, "Who needs a boatman?" <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We've been talking about Buzz Holmstrom, and Lois said he was the guy that stood out of everybody that she saw. If you were gonna pick one out of the bunch, she said that he would be the guy. You're a pretty good interviewer. Oh, you think? Yeah. <laughs> um, Brad, we've been, Brad did a big old piece on Buzz Holmstrom and went through his diaries and stuff. You know, he's darn sure one of our heroes, for sure. Well, I'll, I will try to, to remember. I don't know that I can, 
I don't know that I can give up my buzz letters to you. The, Put a Xerox. All right, I, that I'd be happy to That's do. That's all I want. Xerox. They're, uh, unfortunately, I did keep them in their original envelopes at first, but in the various times that I've gone through the material, they're, um, he he wasn't particularly good about dating them. He usually said this is from Green River or, or whatever, but I, I will be glad to do that. No problem. Maybe it, what you do is just, do you do a Xerox or do you take a picture of it? We do um, a Xerox and they do it on, on acid-free on paper. Sometimes they were... Or they, um, what, uh, or actually... Oh, well, I'll think about it. I, I may change my mind and think that's just the best thing to do with them, to, is to just... Keep them under wraps. Keep, <laughs> have me keep the Xerox, because I, I really did feel very sentimental uh, about him. I don't, it was more a sort of a hero worship deal, than, because, goodness sakes, he wasn't as tall as I, and I was very conscious at the time of not wanting to date anybody that was shorter than I. <laughs> Well, you know, people are so strange, anyhow. <laughs> so. Well, so you, so finally here comes Norman, and he's got these two new guys for Boatman, mm -hmm. and off you go. And what was that like? What did that feel like? Uh, that was a strange feeling because um, Lauren was was a very charming guy, but it, you know, that doesn't register immediately. And and I when when we pulled out at um, it had to have been, let's see, we wouldn't, what comes before Badger Creek? Not much. Paria Ripple. All right. We went through, there was a newsman riding on one of the boats, and so we went through the Riffle, and they parted from us at Badger, that is, um, the Lauren's cousin and the only other person I really remember was a, a newsman of, of some ilk and walked out up Badger Canyon I guess the trail there and uh, and as a matter of fact um, I don't know whether we uh, that was where I waved goodbye to um, to Jean Atkinson, as a matter of fact, and I felt very, um, I really did feel very sad saying goodbye to him. Um, in my diary, I think I wrote that I almost wept when I said goodbye. And um, so we, but as I say, uh, pretty soon it was such fun to talk to Lauren, and he had been so many different places, and he was a good. I don't know how much boating he had he had done. He'd done a lot of surfing. He was a, a very strong swimmer, and um, had a great deal of well, a great deal of charm. So very shortly, I didn't really miss anybody, and and Del Reed. Who came in was just a nice, a nice fellow, and uh, and did things like getting up early and making coffee so that Elzada or I didn't have to, or so it would be done. And uh, so that part, um, the second part of the trip was was very smooth and and um, um, without any real problems in terms of either the, we lined a lot and and today Bob reminded me that we also walked around a lot of rapids um, again some of which I had had forgotten and and I know Elzada would rather have gone down in the boats than than walk over the some of the rough places that we that we did how about you Oh, I, I would rather be in the boats any time. I hated having to walk around. It it seemed like a a demotion. But um, but I think Norm was being very very cautious. And uh, I know <clears throat> I think it was Sandy who said that uh, 
he never wanted, in, in the trips that, that she took with him, he never wanted anybody to get hurt. And, uh, you know, that can make you pretty cautious, too. So, um, and after Emery Kolb joined us, I'm sure that uh, Norm didn't want anything to... Why Why was Emery Kolb... Maybe we should change this tape. Uh, we got to change... Um, this is uh, part three of the Lois Chowder interview, Grand Canyon River Guides, uh, uh, NAU River Runners Oral History Project, September 15th, 1994. And present are Lois Chowder, Karen Underhill, Jeff Robertson, and Brad Dimmick. We're at uh, the football field below Deer Creek in the Grand Canyon. <laughs> now, you were going to ask me something about Emory. Emory, well, you, you were saying that, you know, once Emory Kolb came in, that was a big deal for Norm. And I'm wondering what the, why that was. Why he came? No, how come Norm, how come oh, how Norm co cared what Emory Kolb thought of him? Oh, because he cared what anybody thought about him in, in terms of being a safe boatman. I don't know that he, that, uh, I, I think that was the, the key. He simply didn't want to have any, or... Or perhaps he didn't want to have any kind of a mess up with someone who was an ex river expert as Emory was. Um, Which he was, you know. He, yeah. Hmm? Oh, I just mumbling. <laughs> I think of those guys taking their movie camera down in 1911. In the, <clears throat> I mean, after ruining the camera. And in the in the in the winter time, too. And. Oh. Yeah. Um. Well, what stands out about the canyon, like on like on the first half, you know, and 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 how's and how is it really different now? Oh no, um, actually, I recognize that there are many individual small differences, but the the feeling that you get when you look up and see one high wall lit up and the rest. Uh, less so. Uh, it's just a beautiful place as far as I'm concerned. Um, and the only thing that, and I don't know how, how much this is so, I asked yesterday when we were going through how much one was aware of any pollution because I've been reading about air pollution over the canyon. And there are certainly, yesterday coming through some of that stuff, there was certainly more of a haze than I would have, than I had remembered. And, um, but mainly it looks the same to me. I know there are individual differences in, in the vegetation and in the side canyons and in the rapids too, because Crystal, <clears throat> as I remember it, we were all psyched up for, for Crystal. You really, for Crystal, it was a big deal even then because I didn't. I thought it was. It, a... Well, it may have been the reading, uh, and this I want to go back and read again. See, we we read all the books that were available to us, and some of those I'm sure were were um, maybe not exaggerated. You know what those guys are banging on. What is that? <laughs> but I expected Crystal to be something much more than it than it was. Yeah. Could you stand it? Sure. I wish they would quit it just for a little while. <laughs> Sorry, I'm anal. That's, a, that's <laughs> all right. <laughs> He's waiting to be a librarian, but he doesn't know it yet. No, I'm gonna have to be something here pretty quick. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna have to get some kind of job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you guys heard her say it. Did we get that on tape? <laughs> All right. So let's. Um, what What else haven't I said? Well, <clears throat> you know the the nights here. I think are just gorgeous. I was just looking at the moon coming up over there, and this is one of the reasons I don't want to sleep in a tent. It's just so great to to uh, 
watch everything that's going on and yeah. and the changes and the changes of the light particularly I don't know any other place I've ever been where as the sun rises or sets you see so many different effects or as you go around a bend of the river as far as that's concerned and and I did again have today um, in that section that let's see you weren't on the same boat I was but Brian was talking about the effect in the one part of the canyon um, and I can't tell you right one of the places where we were today where the walls where, the, where you do feel quite enclosed um, in the inner gorge and <clears throat> I believe it's one of the places that some of the early people began to, to feel very, um, very morose. And I, I can see why dark colored walls coming right, not straight down to the water, but uh, doesn't look like an easy way out of there anywhere. Somber is the, is the other word. And uh, that, I, I could certainly see how people felt that way I didn't I didn't feel really somber myself but I had that that same feeling t t today of enclosure and uh, I think there's it's funny there's a well I shouldn't talk it's, in, it's an interesting do you remember just you know the distinct phases of the canyon did they hit you in a certain no, way in, you know you... this is with me unfortunately like trying to remember the various layers as you go down and um, I I tried at first on the on the first trip to be very you know be sure that I could distinguish them all and then there were so many different ones that came in that I just uh, I just gave up and um, and so I, it's the same way um, thinking of Marble Canyon and and the the others. I I think I enjoyed the section that includes uh, sock dollager and grapevine the, as much as any, but chiefly because there was no way in the world we could walk around them, and we, and we had we had to run those and and also the grapevine. I think was a worse rapid then than it is now, but that's again maybe because I was in awe of it then, and, and it was a very exciting ride. Elsie told us afterwards that, and this may be an exaggeration, that as we went up on a wave, she saw the whole bottom of the boat. And, and I know you can see uh, a good bit. On, I've watched that on the, on, the other, on the other boats. There's one little place where if you hit it, hmm? it's, even today, there's... <laughs> God, I wish those guys would do that. <laughs> um, there's one little place where if you hit it, boy, you really get up there. Mm -hmm. You really get the air. Can we pause for just uh, yeah. one minute? Oh, that's uh, great. That. As, you were, as you were speaking, Lois, we don't even have said, to pause. We, you, Lois, you, you know, the light changes and it hits a certain spot. <laughs> <laughs> like Good idea. Am I yeah, the, this oh. is the thing. The, the things that I've been taking with my little automatic camera, if they come out, are all going, not all, they're going to be of walls, though, primarily. Could you sleep out in the open? In 38, about 10. Yes, yes. Yeah, because we, two things, we cut down on equipment to carry and, um, and ex expand, you know, it's quite different from the sort of uh, trip today where the company supplies so many things. Of course, they're, they're paid for it, and I, I recognize that, but we, we really operated, or Norm operated that trip on a, a shoestring. And so you guys brought your own beds and your own stuff. Yes, yes. And 
partly because I already had um, sleeping bags, people that were, I'm sure that people had them, but they were much more expensive in proportion than they are nowadays. And so what I had was the thing that I had taken to Yosemite, which was just a, a ground cl cloth and two flaps that you folded over of canvas. And then I used, I did have an air mattress, and I did um, then fold, I think I had three blankets that I folded over one an another, and you could crawl into whatever layer suited the temperature. But we did use that ground cloth one night up in Cataract uh, to rig up a sort of a fly to all crawl under um, when it started to rain very hard one night. Did it rain very much on you? On no, the just the one one night it rained very hard. Uh -oh. um, a couple of times during the day we might get brief showers, but we we obviously missed what you guys call the monsoon seasons, and um, fortuitously, because we were we were already uh, out of the canyon by August. First. Well, what else stands out about that first trip? I mean, what, what really stands in memory about the first trip through here? Um, Seems like you must be forgetting something. Well, I guess I had never been in a place where the temperature fluctuated, or at least the, the feeling of comfort or discomfort changed so rapidly when you were in the in the canyon and uh, and the sun was shining on you so warm and then it could when you approached the rapids and the breeze came up the canyon when you could feel so uh, usually refreshed uh, so that the rabbits to me were um, a, a comfort factor as as well, because um, Elsie was more used being a Texan and having collected in Texas during the summer. She was much more used to uh, high temperatures than than I as a as a Michigan person, and um, who, and and Yosemite was much cooler too. So. And any family camping I had done was always in, in cool places, so. Um, so that trip ended, and did you stay in contact? Who did, so, and you wrote letters to Buzz. Did you stay in contact with any of those other people? And how did it go with El Zeta and stuff? Um, the people that I, wrote to and uh, and wrote to me. Um, I had a few letters from Bill Gibson. I had letters from Lauren Bell. Um, I don't remember, well, of course, um, I don't remember m much exchange with, um, yeah, can't say it now. Our, our prize boatman who came down to me. Isn't that terrible? You know whom I'm told. We've talked to him and I've said his name. Oh, but uh, Emery Cole. No. No. No, no. I wouldn't. No. The, the, the supreme, the... Buzz. No. No. <laughs> uh, uh, this have... Be be prepared for this sort of thing when you want to to think of a oh, name I or a word. To it's gone. Mm -hmm. Well, we just all we got to do is move on, and you'll think of it. Okay. As soon as you stop okay. Trying. Um, do you did you guys line lava falls and stuff? I mean, the, the rapids. We did, did. Yeah, we did line lava falls. Although, um, I'll be interest. I will be interested to see lava because. Um, I don't think that, I, I don't think that Lauren wanted to line lava. There was a lot of discussion about running or, or lining it. 
and um, but my memory is that indeed we did line it. Of course, Norm didn't line so many things on the lower section uh, of the canyon. Uh, he tended more to have his passengers walk and run the rapids uh, him, himself. So uh, that this would certainly be uh, the, the pattern, but I believe that was not true at, at Lava Falls. I think he didn't. I think he didn't want to to run that. To risk the boats. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. You know, at that point in time, I can see that. Well, did you? So when you left, <laughs> you got married and became a and became a I didn't teacher. get married immediately because I didn't meet my husband until. 1940, I think, and but um, I did get started trying to catch up on the work that I hadn't done on my the on growing the plants that I was supposed to be analyzing for my thesis, and um, and I suspect that's one reason why there were always other things that were on the agenda. I suspect that's one reason why I never had um, a great impulse to come back to the to the canyon the focus had had changed on what i was doing and obviously after after one gets married especially to a beginning college professor you don't have the financial i suppose if i'd really wanted to that there's always a way of doing things but we started a family and it didn't seem that um, that critical a, a part of my life, and I and I really um, there are many people who have known me quite well who didn't realize that I'd ever made the trip. Um, one of my one of the first students that I had after I went back into teaching didn't know this until some uh, until this past year when some reference came up to uh, Bill Cook's book. And she said, what's this book that people are talking about? And, and so then it was, uh, it was mentioned. And, and she was astounded. Um, I don't know just why, but um, it, it she, and, and possibly that was because she had known me first in a teacher-student relationship rather than as a a friend at first. Um, Do you consider yourself an adventurous person? I don't really think of myself as as anything. I don't really think <laughs> anything at, at you know. Well, the, actually, to be brutally frank about it, the, I didn't do any of the planning. You know, this was Elzada's idea to start with, and. And uh, I just sort of fell into it. Um, I didn't think, um, oh, gee, that would be, it would be great to go down the canyon. Um, it wasn't until Elsie started talking about it that, um, so she was really the, the more adventure, certainly the more innovative person. I, I tended, I think, to go with the flow rather than to, and be the idea of person. So. Did you guys stay in, so you didn't stay in contact with her then? For um, up, well, you know, this is another curious thing. When I went back to, actually to, to do my orals, uh, my finals for the degree, we stayed, Vic went with me because I was then seven months pregnant and he didn't want, and during the war, transportation was not not great, and we were. Oh, I would always rather go places by car than by public transportation, and flying wasn't that cheap then either. So we went out to Ann Arbor. Uh, on the, uh, we were in Ithaca, New York, which is a terrible was at the time a terrible place to get any other place. You had to go further north to Syracuse or go further south to pick up one of the rail lines and I think we ended by going by bus simply because it was a more direct route and um, 
so we stayed with El Zeta, and she was was very um, a very good hostess and did ev everything that she that she should. And um, then um, I think re we we corresponded at Christmas time um, generally, but then when um, Doc Marston started um, collecting his history and got to our trip, he contacted um, El Zeta, for, or at least was in Ann Arbor first, and she telephoned me and said that this man who just wanted to get um, unfavorable opinions of Norm had been to see her. And she said, uh, I, I'm not sure how she phrased this. She was very tactful, and she knew that I could be very stubborn and that I didn't like to be told what to do. So it's, I don't remember that she said, please don't talk to him, or I don't, I guess she said, I don't think we should talk to him at all. And I didn't. I, I was more cri much more critical. El Zeta was never critical of Norm, and I was. And um, and perhaps I even welcomed the opportunity to express some of my feelings. But Doc Marston's wife Margaret was a very charming person, and they came and stayed with us a couple days in New Haven, and I did this somewhat the same thing that I did the other evening talking to, to some of you guys when I said more than I really meant to say about the, the trip. Because after all, it was all those years ago, and there was no point in, in rehashing what had come about. So as a result of that, um, I don't know that Elsa knew how how much I had said to Norm, but she was not happy with me, and our friendship did deteriorate to, to some degree. And the final blow came when she went down to do collecting in Guatemala, and my husband was born in Guatemala because his father was with the United Fruit Company, which was a big deal down there. And um, his mother had been born in Costa Rica, and her sister still, still lived in Guatemala City. And the sister was uh, well known for collecting Guatemalan fabrics. And um, so in the, when Elsie w went to, to um, Guatemala City on a collecting trip, uh, somebody, of course, said, well, have you met Lily de Young, whatever her last name was? Well, it happened that my husband was not really pleased with his aunt. And I was, it never occurred to me to write to, I'd never met Aunt Lily, so I wasn't about to write and say, a friend of mine is coming to Guatemala. Uh, would you be nice to her? Because you don't ask favors of people, first of all, that I didn't know personally. And I think if I'd said anything to Vic about it, he would have said, oh, you know, let's not do that. Well, of course, Aunt Lily said to El Zeta, oh, you're from Michigan. Well, do you know my nephew's wife? And Elsie never really understood why I hadn't given her a letter of introduction or, or something. And, you know, this was just one of those sad things that So happens. afterwards you guys kind of drifted apart. So we really didn't communicate after, after well, that. Well, did you ever think that you'd be coming back down here? Did you ever, so? No, I, uh, and, and that's why I, I did jump at the opportunity to, because I thought if I didn't, and of course, here's another thing. This is opportunistic on my my part. Who would have thought that the, a group like this would be in existence, and that I would would have a chance at it? And you you may or may not know I had t 
told some people that in my response to Bob's original letter, I said, yeah, I think this sounds interesting, but how much is it going to cost me? And uh, so that uh, I wasn't willing to put up any, because uh, I knew canyon trips were not inexpensive. And, uh, so even even the fact that it was going to be, um, and I, and I didn't know exactly what the what the in, the group would involve. I didn't realize there was so much support in terms of the photography and the other sorts of things. I wonder. It's too bad that it is so expensive. I wish there was a way. Or, well, it doesn't have to be. I suppose. Well, there's a good reason why it is so expensive. What's so. that? It costs money to run an operation like this. Goodness, think of think of uh, and and well, I realize this is a, is an unusual situation too, but even the boats, the supply stuff, and yeah. yeah. Well, how's it feel to be here with this place? Oh, delightful, and and I'm really very pleased that uh, you know I w I was concerned that I would probably fall down the the back steps. Um, or have some critical accident occur to me that would prevent this uh, this trip, or or I would miss all the planes and you guys would start without me. Uh, there are a lot of scenarios that worry warts can think about, but because I still enjoy traveling by car more than by uh, commercial airliner airlines and stuff. Well, how's it feel to be back down here, to be back in the place? Does it feel the same or friendlier or? Oh, this is, you know, this is such a, a friendly group and uh, such a, a nutty group in a way. Um, I, know, I know that it's customary on canyon trips to do more things like the mud, mud fights or the water fights and, and so on, but we, um, we really didn't take time to do much of that. And and El Zeta was a little distressed when we did have one mud fight and, and didn't didn't join us. Um, I guess maybe because you you do get pretty dirty. <laughs> so those guys were pretty serious about Yeah. Oh yeah. Much much more more serious. We did have some nice campfire. Um, I don't th think we had any marshmallows to roast, but El Zeta did con uh, make some panucci fudge out of what we happened to have in, in camp. And our food wasn't, our food was pretty Spartan um, in, in terms of, of fruits and, and vegetables. And um, yeah, most most of it was canned and uh, and monotonous. I got tired of rye crisp for lunch. With, uh, we'd had jerky for for lunch and and dried fruits when we were in Yosemite, and and we laughed about the strain on our teeth and other sorts of things. But it was a better kind of a thing than than rye crisp and Underwood deviled ham on all. Uh, I don't remember what we alternated with, but I do remember that was one very constant lunch. Convenient, and we, you know, would just pull up to some spot and open a few cans. We may have even had sardines, which is another highly flavored food that I eat, but not frequently. So, so this is just a, a world apart from from the other one, and and the fact that you guys are, you know, are very aware that many of us are not as fleet of a foot or get up and down as easily as we might have other times. I think that's probably easier to cope with if you're a woman because you're probably more used to accepting help from from people than, than guys maybe. I admire these older fellows who um, want to make the trip 
as much as they do that they're willing to have to be I, it can't be easy for guys to be helped to board yeah I know Martin it just pisses him off excuse my French but he can't stand it he can't stand to have somebody helping him he'll let you every now and then but he doesn't like it well, I think all of all of the people accept help very graciously, and and Woody especially, um, so. Um, because his wife was telling me the other day that he had really been uh, a real athlete before he got banged up, and, and he did was one of the early surfers and so forth. This is Woody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he was one of the people that brought the, the first two surfboards over from Hawaii or something. You, you might, I think this is what she told me yesterday. Well, what do you think, guys? What questions yeah, let's, are we... Yeah, let's wrap it up. Well, what are we forgetting? Because well, what happens is we'll get up, we'll go down there in about 15 minutes from now or tomorrow morning. I'll go, God, why didn't, I, why didn't we ask something? Well... Oh, you, can you guys think of something? I wonder if there's something we ought to say or we ought to ask that we're forgetting. Nothing strikes me immediately, but 15 minutes later, but I, I think we've covered it pretty well. Oh, I think more, you know, I'm, I'm all talked out. <laughs> well, okay. Thanks for talking to us. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Great. You're, well, you're an engaging group of people, for one thing. <laughs> and well. it's, uh, for me, it, it does, the river does have the capacity to change life. When I first came to Flagstaff, I was a single mother and had a, this very young child and really thought I wasn't sure of my own abilities and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do this and didn't have the prospect, I didn't think at that point, of remarrying. Uh -huh. and. I uh, met Georgie Clark, who was the oh, really? woman river runner, and uh, interviewed her. And she had had a daughter by herself uh -huh. in the in the 30s and 40s before yeah. her daughter was yeah. killed tragically. But um, I looked at that and thought, well, maybe I could do that. And went on the river trip, and and it really did kind of change my life. I just well, that, that became is, much more confident. Yeah. And how many times have you been This on? is only the second time on the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. I took my daughter on the San Juan, so I thought if I can give to her when she's five, what it took me until I was 30-something to do. So you what never you went think? on the river with Georgie? Not with Georgie. Georgie. No, she passed away um, about six months after I talked to her. Oh, really? So, uh -huh. uh, Richard Corderoli, who is yeah. gone and coming yeah. back, took me. Yeah. Yeah, so. Well, she's... She is an amazing uh, individual, I think, in in terms of uh, of of sheer. With somebody was talking on the boats the other day about her her strength in terms of maneuvering boats and and so forth. And, and just she, a charismatic lady. Yeah, her her style of of river running was the same style of life that. Oh, you just go for it. Uh -huh. She'd say that all the time. Uh -huh. you, you know, don't look back. You go right ahead and full uh -huh. speed. And I, I know one. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're getting him going. <laughs> well, well, why do you think Buzz Holmstrom did himself in? <clears throat> I find, <coughs> excuse me, I find it hard. I found that just incomprehensible at the time it happened. I recognize that he probably felt that he was at a at a dead end but that had never seemed to bother him before um, um, I just um, I just found it very difficult to believe because uh, he because he seemed so self-reliant and I don't I guess many people who are self-reliant have something happen that tips them over to to wipe themselves out but you know. well did this trip change you anyway 
and has it, I mean, come in. Oh, come in. Lots, of, lots of ways. The, the way I think it changed me the, the most was that um, having had all of this uh, attention that came, and there, and there was a lot um, of, you know, people who would come up and say, may I take your picture, or may I, will you sign this for me? And um, I, I had always been, I was a, pretty much of a goody-goody, and had always been very serious about studying and, and so forth and so on. So I think people get a, an image of someone like that that is sort of humdrum and not very exciting. And to go back to Ann Arbor and feel very much more self-assured for whatever, for whatever reason and uh, to feel at least for a while like a minor celebrity and have other graduate students want me to, to talk to Phi Sigma, Sigma Sigma meetings and, um, and generally to have people impressed with me gave me quite a different sense of self-confidence in a, I don't think I ever lacked self-confidence in, in doing things, but in meeting groups of of people, um, I was not as retiring as I had been before. That is, meeting l groups that I where I didn't know anyone. Mm -hmm. I don't think I was ever retiring once I knew people. But so yes, that I think was a a tremendous change. And and do you remember? Have you seen camps? Do you remember places you stayed or anything? Do I remember? Like specific camps oh. or any of that stuff. The trouble with that is I remember the the places that is I can picture them in my mind, but I don't remember the I don't remember the name to attach to them. I do remember a couple of the camps in Cataract.